The latest trailer for Amazon Prime's Rings of Power is a giant billion dollar middle finger to Tolkien and all lovers of the Legendarium. Yes, the trailer gave us three minutes of some compelling imagery, but what is that without canonical characters and story? Which leads us to ask the question, what is shallow beauty without a soul? It's Amazon Prime's Rings of Power. And now Amazon's hard sell begins to convince the world of lies. Will you remain silent or join the fight? You have my sword. And you have my bow. And my axe. I have some exciting news, my friends, on the home front. Before we begin, my baby sister just gave birth to a healthy baby boy, Elijah. So welcome him and welcome Slayer Nation. I hope the weekend has been treating you great. Over the last few days, I don't know what provided more proof that Prime had betrayed Middle Earth. Was it their Comic-Con trailer without a story or the Hall H interviews hosted by grifter Patton Oswald and has-been shill Stephen Colbert? We're going to find out together. Part of our job is to, when you're doing a project, when you go out to sell it, you, you're like, yeah, you have to say you like it. Yeah, you have to say you like it. And there you have it. The truth will always find a way. And if you hold on tight, I have some surprises in store for you. I'm going to pepper throughout this video a lot of clips from Comic-Con of interviews with the actors. And we're going to peel back their lies like an onion. And if what they have to say lights a fire in your belly, then push the subscribe button down below and join the fight to defend Tolkien's beloved Legendarium. Now, Amazon Prime has given us nothing but garbage over the last few months, but I have to admit, this trailer showed us some spectacular images of sets and scenery. I mean, I even got a little bit of the magical, nostalgic feeling climbing up my spine when I looked at the orcs come to life. Using those practical effects that Peter Jackson used was brilliant. And then the white tree of Nimlaw, absolutely gorgeous. But this is Amazon Prime, and that's about all you get. And you deserve better than that. So I'm going to do a quick autopsy, highlighting a few key scenes. That way you'll have the information to judge whether you want to watch this fantasy fiasco. We thought the war at last was ended. So right out of the gate, we got a little bit of a math problem for Prime's Galadriel. But no worries. Galadriel is going to add another title to her long list of achievements. You're going to have Orc Slayer, Xena Warrior Princess, Commander of the Northern Armies, and now Shapeshifter, who can stretch about 16, 17, 18 feet tall, whatever is needed for her new job as Walmart greeter and stacker. But seriously, when I saw that image, it reminded me of something from the 300. And then the inner Tolkien fan bubbled to the surface, and I was like going through the permutations. Is this after the War of Wrath? I was starting to wonder, where does this fit? What does this remind me of? And then I realized Amazon Prime calcified the canon. The lore is butchered. None of it matters because the showrunners treat Tolkien like he's a Shoney's breakfast buffet. They scoop up some character names, slap on some stories, then stuff it all in a half-cooked sausage that they label Tolkien. And then these guys had the nerve to walk into Hall H trying to persuade people that they absolutely love and adore Ea and Arda. Well, so we had the, the privilege of working with uh, Tolkien scholars um, like Tom Shippey and Tolkien scholars um, like Tom Shippey. Did you just hear that? How low do you have to go in your character in order to wave the flag of the guy, which the rumors say you fired Tom Shippey? They're sitting there going, we love Tom Shippey. We worked with him and our lore masters in the writing room. And then you have one of my favorite scenes because it's the greatest example of the grossness of what Amazon has produced. You got the two Xena warrior princesses, wonder twin powers activate. You got Galadriel and Numenor meeting Tarmiriel in a room with a palantir. The two characters who never met embodying people exactly opposite the way that Tolkien wrote about them. See, when you pervert a character, you poison the story. It's like pulling on a thread of a tapestry. Pull one, and eventually the whole thing unravels. Todd Midio was tragic. She wasn't queen like Amazon's presenting her. She was forced to marry her cousin, Arferazan, who took her crown, usurped her throne, and then she tragically died when Numenor was sunk. That's horrible. And how do they present her? 
a queen, another fighter working with Lady Galadriel, their new Joan of Arc. Worst of all, Amazon hired the most wooden actress on the planet, Cynthia Robinson. I get splinters every time I see her try to perform. A single warrior, absent clear head, could herald the end of rebel cause. Rome readies itself for war. And then we have Lenny Henry, a recycled scene of Happy Harry, the hapless hobo Harfoot. Yep, J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, they seem to describe Harfoots the way they depict them as these kind of fantasy tramps. They're like slap on some mutton chops, give some some beards, put straw or salad in their hair, dirty up their hands and feet, dishevel what they're wearing, and voila. We're doing exactly what the professor didn't write. From the Fellowship of the Ring, the Harfoots were browner of skin smaller and shorter, and they were beardless and bootless. Their hands and feet were neat and nimble, and they preferred highlands and hillsides. They were the most normal and representative variety of hobbit, and far the most numerous. As for the canon contortions of Payne McKay, they don't seem to understand much about hobbits. I actually think that they were forced to memorize lines which they happen to forget. Why is there a hobbit story in the Second Age, J.D.? Uh, because uh, well, it's actually not technically a Hobbit story, it's a Harfoot story. Uh, well, it's actually not technically a Hobbit story, it's a Harfoot story. And you just heard him. You just heard him. He's like Harfoots and Hobbits. He thinks they're two separate things, not realizing you got Harfoots, Phalahides, and Stores. But it didn't stop there. These guys actually hit pay dirt with their cast. They got these malleable actors that they were able to manipulate into buying into their BS. Do they live in holes? They, they don't exactly live in holes, but they do live in carts. She believes that they actually live in carts, and that's actually canon in Tolkien's Middle Earth. They were the most inclined to settle in one place and longest preserved their ancestral habit of living in tunnels and holes. My friends, they did not live in big carts. But see, that's what happens when you have bosses who weaponize ignorance in, in order to obliterate a mythology. Tolkien wrote an English mythology as a gift for England. He gifted it to them. He based the hobbits on the Angles, Saxons, and Jukes. No one else. No one. But it didn't stop there. And then we have the Valaraukar in the scourge of Middle-earth known as the Balrog. Now, where did they copy that? It looks like it came right out of Peter Jackson's library in the Weta files. Now, we know that Weta is working with Amazon Prime, but it seems like New Line Cinema is because that looks like an exact copy of Durin's Bane. Now, I don't know if that is or if it's some other Balrog. But what's interesting is every original idea that Payne and McCain have seems to be abysmal. But everything they copy, like the process of using practical effects that Jackson used in his Lord of the Rings trilogy, works here for the orcs. Or borrowing a little bit from Game of Thrones, that works, that scene, even though Tolkien didn't have that much action. Or when they're borrowing his Balrog, nothing they do original seems to stick and feel authentic. And I think a little bit of that ego, a little bit of that narcissism rubbed off on their actors. Because you have actress Sofia Nomvete, who plays the Disa, the Dwarven Princess. I think she decided she was riding high on this delusional success from Comic-Con. So she started telling a few porky pies, selling a few lies. Disa, the first female dwarf that we have ever seen on any screen. Um the first female dwarf that we have ever seen in the works of Tolkien. Uh, and I have the honor to host that revolutionary moment. Um, Obviously I play uh, the, a female dwarf, one of the first female dwarf, and I think um, she is Princess Disa, the first female dwarf that we have ever seen. Um, cinematically within Tolkien's works ever 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 she is a mother she is relatable in so many ways but this is the first time that we see a woman you know this is a ne this is necessary this is a revolutionary moment uh, and it is an honor to be a host of that she is the first ever 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 female dwarf seen on any screen anywhere
Peter Jackson used female dwarfs in what? The Hobbit. Well, the attention star of Diva seemed to need just a little bit more camera time. This time she put the lies to the side and decided to tell the truth of why this series was butchered. Why the canon was cannibalized. The generation that comes after us now, this will be their memory of Tolkien. This will be their memory of the Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. And so we get to um, move that through and just be the beginning of this revolutionary moment for... Was that enough for Sophia? Nope. She roped in the rest of her cast members and they all started sharing the little inner activist of Tolkien's work from a very, very young age, I just think of my young self yeah. and how she would feel to see me on screen and I have a young daughter and how she will feel to see me on screen. So I, I, um, I think that that is, it's incredibly important yeah. in more ways than one. This to me just feels like something that has just the furthest possible reach and, you know, we're choosing to tell it in these times so we should represent it for these times. Unbelievable. But I think the perfect person to put them in their place isn't me, it's the professor. From letter 210, the canons of narrative art in any medium cannot be wholly different. And the failure of poor films is often precisely in exaggeration and in the intrusion of unwarranted matter owing to not perceiving where the core of the original lies. I love when the professor speaks to something that they are exactly doing. It's like he's coming from beyond the veil and going, no. It's not done that way, gentlemen. One of the great reasons I'm happy to see the smile on my face besides my baby nephew is because of what Prime is doing. They are spending right now tens of millions on buying social media ad buys, and they're going to be doing commercials. Now, you're going to see right here on screen, they're already putting out Kit Kats with uh, the Dwarven King and then Dwarven Prince and then Lady Galadriel. They're merchandising the hell out of us. People are going to realize how cheap these guys are going to go. But the greatest feat that Amazon Prime is doing right now is getting average, everyday, normal people excited. See, when Peter Jackson's films came out, it's been guesstimated that we had 100 to 200 million people went out and bought the books and became part of the fellowship. The same thing is going to happen here. Everyday normies are going to watch a couple of these episodes. And I think right around episode three or four, it's all going to drop off because that's where I've heard rumors that it just is abysmal. But that's regardless the point. They're going to read the books. They're going to look at the appendices. They're going to read the Silmarillion. And then they're going to compare it to Prime's perversion. And boy, oh boy, I wouldn't want to be J.D. Payne or Patrick McKay at that point. See, Prime right now is both devious and desperate. Those are the only types who use hard sell tactics. The teasers and the trailers are nothing but infomercials. They are designed to convince the audience that they love and honor Arda and Tolkien while at the same time unethically using dialogue written into the story to persuade them that all true Tolkien lovers who refuse to update with the times, who refuse to get along, are nothing but bigots and liars. That means that they are losing. And the heart of the darkness tries to snuff out the light, the brighter it burns. Remember that and get out there and lead by example and roar. We never bow down, we never bend the knee. Firmly defiant, step up, stand tall, and get busy living your best life now, always forward. <laughs>